But at this moment, is this yet another headwind, this geopolitical risk that we see, certainly for China-exposed tech names? I think it's a tremendous um, risk. Um, and I think that what's going on in China is that politics is going to trump economics. Mm. And I'm surprised it took them this long to actually ban the iPhones after what we've done to Huawei. And I think they timed it, not just with Gina Raimondo's issue, but uh, visit, but they also timed it right before Apple announces its new phone. Timing is pretty impeccable on their start, and, and certainly from a media perspective. But from a, a buying perspective, from a how this unfolds, are you expecting supply chains to be impacted? Are you worried and looking at arms exposure as they start to look to come to the market publicly, as we think about a Tesla that has a lot of focus on a Chinese consumer? Right, and I think that, I think that there's two things. From the Chinese side, they have so many of, of the Chinese citizens working on all the supply chains for all these companies that I think that they have to be careful in terms of how, how, how all of these measures are put into place. But on the other hand, I think that it's important to recognize that China's political agenda is so strong and it's so important to the government that that is going to trump every time, even the fact that it might hurt their own people as they, as they really ban some of the uses of, of uh, Western products. And I think actually that one of the most dangerous things is the anti-American feeling mm. that could prop up because of this nationalistic uh, push. And that means that people that are not in government offices, people that are not in state-owned enterprises, will actually start to not buy American products. Mel, good to see you, Ed, here in San Francisco. Hey, good to see you, Ed. As a technology investor in the balance of risk, you know, this was the year of the Fed and when we will end the rate cycle upwards, the year of AI. Now you have China. And how do you assess the balance of those risks? Which one do you apportion most worry to? Well, I, I think China is a huge risk, but I think that the momentum of AI is going to be much greater and is going to have much more impact uh, for investors. And um, I think some of the estimates are that, that AI is actually going to add a trillion and a half of productivity to the economy over the next 10 years. And that's going to be huge. And so I think that you know one of the things that's going on is that, and it's what's great about uh, U.S. businesses, is that they reinvent themselves. They, they figure out how to deal with these risks. I mean, there is already a tremendous amount of French shoring going on. There's a tremendous amount of de-risking that's going on uh, in terms of China. And so I, I would give more weight to AI than I would to China. The, uh, the guys over at JP Morgan have a note out and they say, like, China's a headline risk. But they also point out it's a name that was trading at 27 times forward earnings. And so I wanted to ask how you, you kind of view the Fed as it relates to the technology sector right now. Well, I, I think that it got a little ahead of itself. And actually, we, we sold down on some of our uh, tech uh, stocks or some of our growth stocks and actually invested in value stocks. Uh, because I think the, the difference in the multiples uh, are significant. And over time, they tend to even out uh, and balance. So for our investors, we suggested taking down some of the profits that they had in the tech stocks and actually rebalancing into, into value stocks. OK, so even as you talk about the productivity lift that AI will give, you were thinking take profits. Is there any area that is still yet to see the rampant rise and implication of AI? Well, I think what's clear is that the companies that basically are dealing with the infrastructure of AI are going to keep on going. The question is how fast, how fast is the market valuing them ahead of their actual earnings? There's no question about what we don't know. And I think what's much more difficult is how is AI going to impact the regular businesses mm -hmm. that we all do? And what is that going to mean in terms of our earnings, our productivity, et cetera? That's the harder picture. It's very easy to just talk stocks, but yeah. you are diversified in your viewpoint and in, indeed in your asset class. When you're looking at growth versus value, are you thinking that across also the bond market as well? Are you thinking about other types of ways in which you gain exposure to technology, not just in an equity basket? Well, I think when we think about our investors, we think about overall returns, right? And overall returns over a long period of time. And I think what's really interesting is that 
now the fixed income market in corporates, very liquid, a very high quality, you can get six or seven percent. If you look at the long-term capital market expectations for the U.S. equity markets, it's about seven to eight percent. And you think about the volatility of the equity markets, I think fixed income, high quality fixed income is actually a great opportunity right now for most investors. Mel, every time you're on the show, we talk about the big names, Apple, NVIDIA more recently, and then you surprise me with your top picks that are, that are something a little bit different to what people are talking about. Which corners of the technology market specifically catch your eye right now? Again, I think, I think that all of the sort of the, the companies that are working on the infrastructure that's going to be required for AI, because I think that's the most obvious. The other ones are a lot less obvious. Mel, next Tuesday, I'll be down in Cupertino at Apple for their next iPhone event. Is that something that you watch? Do you sit there, watch the whole thing and think, my goodness, this is a big tech event or it's not? I don't personally watch it, but I read all the stuff and watch all the stuff that you report on it. 